Today I want to discuss one of my favorite 17th century Dutch businessmen turned scientist, Antony van Leeuwenhoek. I know there's not a large pool of candidates for that title, but even if there were, van Leeuwenhoek would be at the top of my list for his contributions to biology. Also pictured here is his wife Cornelia. Her contribution is also important here, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. Antony started out life as a draper selling cloth in the Dutch Republic. He would later become a royal official, and official wine gouger, whatever that means. But we remember Antony best for his work in microscopy. Remember that draper job? He made his own lenses so he could inspect the quality of the cloth and fibers he was selling. And he would eventually create a method to create lenses so small that it allowed him to view microscopic life. He observed some mundane things like cork cells, plant cells, and muscle fibers, but would also discover protists and bacteria. He showed this microscope off to his buddy, Rainier de Graaf, who immediately wrote to the Royal Society in London, urging them to check out Antony's work. Henry Oldenburg, editor of the Journal of the Royal Society, was so impressed that he learned Dutch just to translate Antony's letters because Antony couldn't be bothered to learn English or Latin. No, Antony didn't see himself as a scientist, partly because the term wouldn't be created for another 150 years. Instead, he saw himself as a businessman, a businessman with a whole monopoly on the business of microscopy. No one could figure out how he made his lenses for his microscopes. He even went out of his way to mislead people to ensure that he would be remembered for his microscopes. Well played, Van Leeuwenhoek. But I want to tell the story about his work on sperm in 1677. He was requested by the Royal Society to look at human semen, with conception being an area of intense interest during this time, and all times come to think of it. Antony, however, was incredibly reluctant, either because it sounded like a joke or it's just gross. Luckily, Antony was saved providing his own sample, as a medical student was more than willing to provide semen for Antony. And no, not in the way you might be thinking. The medical student brought Van Leeuwenhoek a vial of semen that was spontaneously discharged by a man with gonorrhea. From this, Van Leeuwenhoek concluded that semen contained microscopic animals with long tails. But when he went back to observe the sample a few hours later, as one does, these animals were all dead. So that's it. That's how we discovered sperm, right? Wrong. This wasn't good enough. No, Van Leeuwenhoek was now a man of science whether he liked it or not, and he was going to defend himself from criticism. Surely, he thought, a sick man's semen is different than a healthy man's semen. There was only one way for Antony to know for sure, being of sound body and mind himself. But Antony was also a devout Christian, and in his own words, Whatever observations I make, I do without polluting myself. For I have examined nothing but what nature, after its free course, would leave from time to time. This is a nice way of saying that within seconds after making love to his wife, I told you it should be important, I hope you remembered that, he rushes out of the bedroom to grab his microscope, he collects what nature left from time to time, and holds his microscope aloft. What he found was a teeming collection of sperm, where he was able to describe their movement and draw them for the Royal Society, though he urged the Royal Society, if his observations were too vulgar, to exclude them from publication. Fortunately for the rest of us, the Royal Society was excited by the discovery and published his findings the very next year. A few years after his sperm sighting, Antony van Leeuwenhoek was nominated to be a member of the Royal Society, an honor he was so enamored by he didn't attend his induction ceremony and never attended a single meeting. No, instead, Antony spent the rest of his life examining the vast diversity of life invisible to the unaided eye until his death. They even named a disease after him, which he helped characterize in his last letters to the Royal Society before finally succumbing to Van Leeuwenhoek disease at the age of 90. So remember, folks, anyone can contribute to scientific progress. Or at the very least, you have the new pickup line, Would you help me recreate Van Leeuwenhoek's famous experiment? But that's all I have for today. I'm Will Faulkner, and thanks for watching.